is it. Thank you. And we are starting the uh, YouTube video. Okay. Perfect. Welcome, everybody, and uh, thank you for joining the Los Angeles City Health Commission on our August 29th, 2022's virtual Health Commission meeting. Uh, we have a wonderful uh, agenda for today, and can we have a roll call, please? Yes. Commissioner Avila. Present. Commissioner Chapa. Present. Commissioner, Commissioner Estradas. Uh, she said she would be joining, but I don't see her yet. Commissioner Grimmig. I do not see Commissioner Grimmig either. Commissioner Hissarik. Present. Commissioner Cato. Present. Um, just a reminder, I'm sorry, but I have to leave at um, 6.50. Thank you. Thank you. Commissioner Calfani, uh, let us know that she will be absent. Commissioner Lemos will also be absent. Commissioner Mandel? Present. Commissioner Osi? Present. Commissioner Pack? Do not see Commissioner Pack yet. Commissioner Shannon? Do not believe she has joined us either. Commissioner Sirota? Present. Great, thank you. We have a quorum. Thank you. Uh, is there um, anybody in the area for public comments? Yes, there is one person waiting. Um, can we invite them in, please? Yes. Good evening, Speaker. You are on the line with the Los Angeles City Health Commission. Caller with phone number ending in one, please press, please press star six to unmute yourself and state your name and the agenda item you are speaking on, please. Good evening. I'm a stakeholder. I just wanted to ask if all agencies involved would be kind enough to remind citizens as we start approaching cold and flu season, apparently a lot of social common courtesies during the pandemic have been lost, such as when coughing, covering one's mouth, because during the pandemic we were wearing masks, triple layered so people did lost the tendency to cover their mouths and now as the city has um, taken the mask indoor mask requirement rescinded that order it it's the proliferation of people coughing and I'm not talking about clearing one's throat I'm talking full-on coughing open mouth people are not making an attempt to cover their mouth cough into their elbow. So perhaps those old school reminders of where the appropriate etiquette when coughing, because like I said, open mouth coughing is everywhere. And it's especially personally, my story is the person approaching me starts coughing and just I approach them right in their airspace when all those lovely germs are out there. So again, if you be all the agencies involved, kind enough to remind society Social common courtesies, etiquette, where to call. Thank you so much. Have a lovely evening. Thank you, Speaker. We wish you a happy, healthy uh, Labor Day weekend. Uh, any other individuals in the public comment uh, waiting area? Yes, one more. Please let them in. Good evening, Speaker. You are on the line with the Los Angeles City Health Commission. Call with phone number ending in 678. Please press star 6 to unmute yourself and state your... Name and the agenda item you are speaking on, please. Just to reiterate, please press star six to unmute yourself. Okay, hearing nothing, we can we can move on. Thank you. Uh, looking for a neighborhood council. Is there anybody in the neighborhood council? Yeah, seeing none, uh, then 
uh, both public co comment and neighborhood council commentary um, is now closed. Um, does one of the uh, commissioners want to make a motion for AB 361? Make a motion. Uh, thank you, uh, Commissioner uh, Avia. Um, you're going to have to read it uh, as per uh, state law if you have it in front of you. If not, we can get it for you. It's on the um, last month's minutes, which was sent to you. If I, I have it, if you want me to make the motion. Uh, Please, Commissioner Hissarik, can you make the motion? And, and uh, if Farmer is, is, is accepting, she can second. Okay. I move that the Los Angeles City Health Commission determine in accordance with AB 361, Section 3E3, that this legislative body has reconsidered the circumstances of the state of emergency and that the state of emergency continues to directly impact the ability of the members to meet safely in person and or state and local officials continue to impose or recommend measures to promote social distancing. Okay, I think that's it. Okay, that is, and then we have a second. Uh, is there any discussion on the motion on the floor? Seeing no uh, discussion, can we have a vote, please? Yes, Commissioner Avila. Yes, I'm second. Thank you. Commissioner Chapa. A yay. Commissioner Estradas uh, has not joined us yet. Commissioner Grimmick, I believe, is also not here. Uh, Commissioner Hissarik. Uh, aye. Yes. Commissioner Cato. Yes. Commissioner Calfani is absent. Commissioner Lemus is absent. Commissioner Mandel. Agree. Commissioner Osi. Yes. Commissioner Pack is absent. Commissioner Shannon, I believe, is also not here yet. And Commissioner Sirota. Approved. Motion carries. Excellent. Thank you. Now we move on to the next agenda item. It's with uh, uh, great honor and, and pleasure to uh, introduce to really stellar leaders in Los Angeles uh, for a presentation. Uh, Dean Dana Goldman is the uh, Erwin and Ion Pierre Chair of the USC Saul Price School of Public Policy and co-director of the USC Schaefer Center, as well as the distinguished pr professor of public policy, pharmacy, and economics at the University of, of Southern California. And uh, Dr. Aaron Tisch, co-director of the USC Schaefer Center, an associate professor at the Department of Pharmaceutical and Health Economics at the University of Southern California. And uh, Drs. Goldman and Trish are going to talk about and educate us in the city of Los Angeles about pharmaceutical policies, drug pricing, as well as the effects on innovation. Um, thank you. Uh, we're honored to have you both here. Thank you very much. Floor is yours. Thank you, and uh, actually, we're quite honored to be here with you, and I will say that uh, I've known Dr. Mandel for many years, and is, despite being an MD, he's well-versed in economics as well and understands a lot of these issues. Um, and in addition, he delivered both of my sons, and I'm holding him harmless for all the, the, the distress they've subsequently uh, given me. So, <laughs> if, if I could say, Dr. Goldman, for the record, uh, your wife delivered the kids. Uh, I, I got a little tiny bit of assist. But she, did, <laughs> she, she did all the work for the for the for the public's information. There you go. I, yeah, that's been a, that's been a thirty year problem of mine. So, um, thank you for having us, and feel free to interrupt uh, with questions. Um, but. I thought I'd start at the kind of a 30,000 foot view of how economists think about this market. And, you know, what you see here is the cost of treating 
multiple sclerosis, and it's shown uh, using traditional disease, the cost of traditional disease-modifying therapies, and then what happens to the cost when you start introducing new treatments and new doing new clinical trials. And the way we usually think about markets as economists is that, you know, if you can get new products to enter the market, they should be lowering the price. And what's remarkable about this figure is that the median cost of the drug for treating MS is going up even though you have new products coming online. And this poses a real dilemma for those of us who work in this area, and it causes a lot of the hand-wringing, and uh, we'll bring this back to uh, the Inflation Reduction Act uh, at, by the end of the talk. So, But I think there are four lessons I want to share that, I, that are really important as we discuss pharmaceutical prices. And I, first, I want to talk about what we mean by price. Uh, and, you know, the argument cancer is probably the best example uh, that people are aware of. We know cancer care is expensive. Often that uh, the argument goes that despite the cost, it doesn't improve mortality much. And, in fact, that aggressive treatment reduces the quality of life. We know that chemotherapy can be very burdensome for individuals and their families. And so... Uh, you know, a good example of this is Avastin or Bevacizumab to treat colorectal cancer. So when that was first um, employed for uh, metastatic disease, uh, metastatic colorectal cancer, what you see is something uh, like, this was published in the New England Journal of Medicine, and what you saw was the median survival gain for um Bevacizumab versus placebo it was about four month increment, and at the time the treatment costs were sixty thousand dollars. And so, when we think about price as economists, what we say is price of what? And the way we often do it is the price of a life year. And so, if you take sixty thousand dollars and divide it by four months, is a third of a year what you get is that the cost, the incremental cost effectiveness ratio, if you will, is $180,000 per life year. And I know there's a lot of interest in what goes on in other countries. So when the United Kingdom, which regulates, has national health insurance, has an agency that regulates uh, pharmaceuticals and makes recommendations to the government, when they looked at this, they said, well, you get a third of a year of survival, and each year is worth, at that time, they were saying $60,000. So um, there would be $20,000 in value, but the cost of the drug was $60,000, U.S. dollars. So uh, when the National Health Service looked at Bevacizumab for cancer, they did not recommend it for treatment. Now, this caused enormous pushback in Canada. In fact, at the time that this was done, they ended up coming up with exceptions to their policy. Um, and I think part of the problem is where does the value of this life year come from? How do they get $60,000 per life year? But um, if you start looking at what uh, but I want to, and, and part of the problem is that we're not thinking about these things the right way. So here's another example from metastatic melanoma with the clinical trial for ipilimumab versus um, standard of care. And what they saw, this was in 2010, again published in the New England Journal. And what you see here is that people in the control group shown in red. By the end of 48 months, there was no one who survived, and this was, re reflects what a pernicious disease this is. And if you look at the data, what you see is with ipilimumab, which was uh, considered a novel therapy at the time, um, again, we saw something like 3.6-month median survival improvement. 
Um, and there was an article in the New York Times about this saying, you know, this costs $120,000. And again, the incremental survival is about 3.6 months. But really, when you start talking to patients, it turns out that the patients, if you look, 20% of the patients, it turns out, had a durable response. They lived four years, and actually, there's evidence that this continued out after the trial. That is, there was a, another way to say this is that there was a three Three point three and a half month improvement in median survival versus a one in five chance of curing a previously uncurable cancer. And these are the same drugs. And the point is, the way we think about them is very different than if we just use, say, median survival. And, you know, if you look, there's been a lot of discussion, and this came up in the Inflation Reduction Act, that... Um, the right metric should be price per life year gain, so the value of a drug. If you look at launch prices uh, for cancer drugs, over time they were going up, not down, which looks a lot like the multiple sclerosis example I showed you earlier. But it turns out that um, if you use mean life expectancy instead of median, which takes into account what's going on in the tails, it, what you get is that actually launch prices are quite flat. And um, that's what you see in the gray versus the dashed line. And indeed, if you start looking more recently, there's even evidence, whoops, I'm having some sensitivity issues with my mouse here. But there's actually evidence that launch prices, when you adjust for the, the clinical benefits from the drug, are actually going down. So the point of this is that maybe what we care about is not the price of the drug, but the price relative to its effectiveness. And there is evidence that as more products are entering the market, they're functioning better than we might have thought. Now I want to turn my attention to the second lesson, which is to really take into account the long term. And I think you know, COVID is probably brings this into sharpest relief. But in the short run, when a, when a drug is available, what we know is we want, un, so think about COVID vaccines. The best thing, any markup above cost limits access. And so the best thing is actually to give it away. And that's actually what we did in the case of COVID. Um, and, you know, to economists, the price should be set at cost of production. But producing the vaccine was very cheap. Um, but the problem is that in the long run, we also want access to new treatments. And we know if we just gave everything away for free, we would never get new R&D. And, you know, this principle, it's not like it's something new. We know we need um, financial incentives to reward risk. And indeed, you know, this is enshrined in the Constitution, which literally defines patents uh, and provides inventors with access. And we've expanded that over time through the FDA and the like. Um, and so this really sets up this tension between patient rights and patent rights, uh, if you will. And so I think one important point to understand, and this got lost in the IRA uh, debate, we're going to call it IRA from now on, <laughs> Uh, that, you know, there is a, a it, it, and probably let me show you with some, if you look worldwide, Alzheimer's kills about 1.5 million people uh, annually. These are older data, but uh, the numbers haven't changed much. Tuberculosis is about the same, uh, killing about 1.4 million people. Um but if you look, what you see is that if you array it by uh, how wealthy countries are, what you see is poor countries, uh, tuberculosis kills 1 million people, whereas in high-income countries, Alzheimer's and dementia, tuberculosis isn't even on the list in Alzheimer's, and that makes sense because it's a disease of older age, and you all understand that quite well. 
But the point is that we have a lot more R&D for Alzheimer's than tuberculosis. And that's the luxury of being in a rich country that pays a lot for treatment. We encourage R&D. And so, to, in fact, when it comes to fighting TB, which is a, as a global burden of disease, is even greater than Alzheimer's because it affects so many people at younger ages, we have to rely on philanthropy in order to fund it. And so you'll see the, the UN and the Gates Foundation and others are investing in a lot of these trials. Um, and, you know, again, in the, we have other evidence from rare diseases with the Orphan Drug Act. We came along and we were, we were worried that people weren't investing in innovation to treat rare diseases. They, Congress passed the Orphan Drug Act in 1982, and it created incentives for innovation. And lo and behold, um, it, has, it, it did exactly what it did. And now, in fact, we're in a world where a lot of things are being, in fact, this may, this may be perverted in some ways that we've made, encouraged people to only treat, find cures or uh, for rare diseases in some ways, and we can come back to that. But I think where this played out the most dramatically was in HIV, and I'm going to go through this uh, very quickly. If you look at the survival curve in 1984 uh, for HIV, it was uh, a rather de depressing, especially when you consider it was afflicting people very early at the prime of their lives. Um, by, by 1994, you know, we used to think we didn't make any progress uh, with AZT, but actually we learned some things in the medical profession, and we were able to extend the survival curve. But what really changed things was antiretroviral therapy, which were introduced in 1995. And by 2000, this is what the survival curve looked like, and this is one of the greatest innovation success stories in the history of the world, actually, that we extended life expectancy uh, for HIV by 15 years um, and even extended life expectancy for people who had AIDS uh, as well. And, you know, those of us in Los Angeles at that time, I had just come to Los Angeles uh, around 93 and 94, and I saw Magic Johnson diagnosed with HIV, and I thought that was the last I was going to see of him. I, I was working in that field as a young economist, not so young anymore. And now, ironically, Magic Johnson now owns the Dodgers, so that just shows you where we are. Um, and what did that? So if, as an economist, we can say 15 years of life multiplied by millions of people who uh, have had this disease and then multiply that by the value of a life year, which is about 100, 150,000. And what you quickly get is that the introduction of these drugs um, uh, ended up generating about $1.5 trillion in value to society. Now, here's the problem. This comes back to the point of about prices. When these drugs were introduced, people were horrified that companies were making $63 billion off these drugs. And as an economist studying this issue, what, what it occurs, it, you look at this and you say 5% of the value created by the introduction of antiretroviral therapy went to the manufacturers. And you could actually argue this was too low. So think about diabetes. When we model out diabetes, we think that um, a cure for diabetes would probably be worth about $3 trillion in America. And if you gave 5% of the innovation to whoever developed that cure, that would be $120 billion. But when we cured hep C and they were charging uh, 100000 for therapy, people got very upset. So... I think the, the, the point of this is that, you know, I mean, this is something I said in the New York Times, we really need to think of healthcare like uh, investors. Um, 
and we need to be investing where we have the greatest return. And in fact, you know, one of the things, uh, for example, is if we could get everyone, and this is, I'll, I'll put this back on the commission, if you could get everyone in L.A. to just take a walk, it would probably save us a lot of money and be great for everyone's health and have millions of dollars in benefits to the city and the county and even the state. And yet no one gets reimbursed for figuring out a way to get anyone to walk, uh, which is kind of strange. Um, so finally, this uh, I, I just want to go through, I'm going to skip some of this. Uh, I just want to say that you know, one of the great inventions here, again, you know, we talked about HIV. Statins show a similar uh, effect. There was about $950 billion in value when you add up all the extra life years and hospitalizations, and about 25% of that value went to the manufacturers. And so that's more than in the HIV example, and created companies like Pfizer uh, into the juggernaut it is today. Uh, COVID didn't hurt either for Pfizer. But, um, you know, we, along came, it still turns out that a lot atherosclerotic disease is still uh, a big issue in the United States. There are 8 million people who aren't being treated. And along came these, a new class of drugs, PCSK9 inhibitors. And at the time, everyone said, we're going to be spending $100 billion dollars on PCSK9 inhibitors, and they're going to swamp healthcare. Well, what happened with PCSK9 inhibitors is, again, they, you know, if they had the true efficacy that we thought, they had the, the potential to avert 15 million major cardiac events and save 1 million lives, you know, similar story that we've been talking about. But what happened is they were priced too high. And what that reflected is optimism on the part of the um, manufacturers that they were more valuable than they might otherwise be. And I'm going to skip some of this. But basically, it, remember I said with HIV, the innovators were getting about 5% of the value. And I said with statins, they were getting about 25% of the value. It turns out with PCSK9, they had priced it rather aggressively, and about 50% of the value was flowing back to the manufacturers. And so the result is there wasn't a lot of uptake. And so the question is, what do we do about this? Should the government step in, as we've uh, recently seen, um, and reprice these things? Or uh, what I would argue is that we need to figure out better ways so that we can still encourage innovation. And part of that may be linking payment to outcomes. You know, if I buy an iPad and I take it home and it doesn't work, I get my money back. But if I uh, do cholesterol lowering therapy and it doesn't work, I'm still, my insurer is still out the same amount. Uh, and so in a consumer-based economy where a lot of things operate that way, it could be that we need to explore outcomes that are tied to my cholesterol lowering or other strategies. And I'm happy to. The, the final point I want to make, though, is that, um, and I'm running out of time, you know, we talked a lot about could, com, could we do like the UK and be doing cost effectiveness. I, I got my start working in cost effectiveness uh, in 1993. And actually, there was a federal agency, the Office of Technology Assessment, at the time that was doing studies on medical technology, uh, you know, gastrointestinal endoscopy um, and immunosuppressive drugs and the like. And actually, it's the only example of a congressional agency that's ever been deleted. Uh, but this was uh, the contract for America under Newt Gingrich they, uh, they got rid of the Office of Technology Assessment. But, you know, comparative effectiveness potentially um, provides an answer to what we're doing. But I just want to give you one cautionary tale, and then I'll turn it over to Aaron, to, uh, because I can see that I, I'm probably using burning a lot of time. 
Um, if you think about the way we, uh, two treatments, and I call them red pill and blue pill, but they're not the same drug. Think of them as drug A and drug B. And every person has a range of responses in terms of efficacy. So some people over, over here will benefit from taking the blue pill, and some people over here would benefit from taking the red pill. And if this is what the population distribution looks like, then the average effect is um, that blue pill looks better on average. And what we've done in healthcare recently, and this is what happens with PBMs and with formulary policy, is we say to everyone, you know, you should be taking the blue pill. But the, the point of that is that there's a bunch of patients and you have to try the blue pill before you can take the red pill. But it turns out that's going to impose some loss on the minority of patients who don't respond. And so... Whether this formulary policy and comparative effectiveness can work really depends on whether we can identify populations, and these are two extreme examples, who might benefit from these. And so this is where tailored precision medicine may play a role in helping us figure out um, uh, precision medicine. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Aaron to talk a little bit about what that means for the current legislative environment. Sure. Thank you. So I'll just summarize briefly where we are, and then we're happy to take questions and, and answer anything you might uh, have. So I think, you know, despite the, the compelling uh, discussion that Dana just led, our federal policymakers recently took a pretty uh, different approach with the passage of the Inflation Reduction Act. So if you think back to his patient rights, patent rights, and the long-term and short-term affordability, I think they were really swayed by the compelling narrative coming from the American public, right? That the vast majority of Americans think drugs are too expensive, that they can't afford filling prescriptions, that they're abandoning prescriptions at the pharmacy counter, and that this was really a pocketbook issue for Americans and for households, and wanted to step in and do something to uh, improve affordability. So what did they do? Um, to that effect, for the first time, so Medicare Part D, which provides drug coverage for the elderly in America, has been in existence since 2006, but what we've done is rely on uh, private plans to provide prescription drug coverage for the elderly and to do the uh, negotiation over how much should we pay for those drugs, how much should patients pay out of pocket, what should be covered on the formulary, those types of things, to let these private insurers negotiate uh, with manufacturers rather than having the federal government do that and make that decision writ large for everyone. Um, what, what's now happened is that basically the federal government has stepped in and passed a law that said instead we're going to have uh, the Health and Human Services Office uh, negotiate the price of a handful, 10 to 15 drugs, of uh, the highest selling, kind of longest on the market drugs, and say, you know, we need to take advantage of the, the kind of larger bargaining or purchasing power of the Medicare program and try to bring down the prices of these drugs. So starting in a couple of years, you're going to step in and negotiate the price of drugs. There's also a series of provisions that um, manufacturers basically have to pay back money to the federal government if they raise the prices of their drugs faster than inflation, and also a set of policies that require manufacturers to provide significant uh, discounts off the price of their drugs as well. And so the goal of these provisions has been to try to solve the affordability uh, problem for, for patients. I think the kind of grand irony of, of this uh, set of uh, provisions that has passed is that in many ways it raises the types of concerns that Dana was describing about the, the impact on innovation and, long, and access to long-term new products. It kind of disables us from being able to pursue the types of policies that he was, he was describing related to of outcomes-based pricing or, or a world where you want to encourage manufacturers to come onto the market at low prices, provide wide access, but then if they prove they can deliver value in the real world, we want them to be able to raise their prices in that scenario. And the imposition of this, this law prohibit, or requiring them to pay back any money, at any, uh, any dollars at which they raise the price of their drugs faster than inflation will really discourage those types of contracts from evolving. 
um, in the private market and, and discourage the, the type of access that, that he was describing. I think the other concern here is that, you know, it, I think it's still a very open question about to what extent this really is going to address the affordability concerns that were the initial goal. So the law actually somewhat ironically um, delays a set of rules that related to require, and one of the big things in the Medicare Part D program now is that rebates that are negotiated by pharmacy benefit managers, so the intermediaries who have kind of stepped in to do much of this negotiation over prices and formulary access, companies like Express Scripts and Optum, What's happened is that the list price or the, the price that you see in the news or at the pharmacy counter of many branded drugs has increased pretty significantly over the last decade or so, but the net price that manufacturers are actually receiving has been much flatter over that and, and in many cases has actually fallen for many drugs over that time. The problem is that patients tend to pay cost sharing that reflects that rising list price and these manufacturers are, are giving rebates or after the fact discounts back to the pharmacy benefit managers, and that's not necessarily getting into the hands of patients, um, instead going to subsidized premiums or going staying in the pocketbooks of the pharmacy benefit manager. So the Trump administration had actually uh, pushed forward a policy that would kind of break that tie and require that savings that are generated from rebates to be shared with patients at the pharmacy counter Ironically, the Inflation Reduction Act undoes that and uh, pushes implementation of that down the line as a means to try to capture some, kind of to play some budgetary uh, shenanigans in some sense to get this law passed. But, you know, there are important provisions like capping the amount that Part D beneficiaries are required. There's now will be a $2,000 maximum annual out-of-pocket spending cap. Um, and some uh, reduction or some limits on, for example, patients who take insulin won't have to pay more than $35 a month out of pocket. So a couple of things that, that do help to alleviate the affordability burden from the patient's perspective, but in many ways not addressing the bigger issue of the kind of distortions in this market and the negative impact that that's had on, on beneficiaries. So I think, you know, we're happy to answer more questions about any of this. Um, we'll turn it over to uh, Dr. Mandel. Thank you. Thank you both um, for uh, giving us your wisdom. Uh, Commissioner Cato, I, I know you have a, a very short time frame. You need to leave. Do you want to ask uh, any questions this evening? Um, no, not at this time. Thank you. Um, I really liked... Um, being able to see it from a different perspective that uh, uh, I hadn't uh, thought about before, um, the economic part. And um, so it was very interesting. I, I really uh, thank the two of you for taking this time uh, for doing this. And uh, just one quick question. With, uh, you know, the, the government trying to regulate the the prices of, uh, of the drugs, uh, what do you foresee will um, happen uh, with, like, the R&D that you were, you were um, talking about? Well, I, I think there are two effects. That's a great question, and thank you. Uh, there are two effects to think about. The first is what happens to will we discourage innovation? And the second is what will it do to what uh, Aaron was talking about, which are launch prices, when the drugs enter the market. And those are two different effects. And part of it depends on how the government negotiates. I mean, actually, um, you know, the government sets prices for a lot of things in the Medicare program right now. And actually, if they did a good job on assessing value in a really fulsome way, it might actually have a salubrious effect in that sense. Like if they thought about HIV the way we thought about HIV in that study, then I think it, I think people are quite skeptical, though, that, you know, that this is going to be used as a hammer to bludgeon manufacturers. And so what you're seeing is that investment dollars are going to probably leave this field until this gets clarified. But the point that Aaron made, which is that 
you know, like the PCSK9 example is a very important one. The companies could have said, you know, we don't know if these are going to be like the next statins. Let's start at a low price. And if they're effective, you're going to reward us and allow us to raise our prices. We've now taken that off the table. And every manufacturer, ironically, is going to be launching at very high prices because of these inflationary taxes that if you raise your price above inflation, you're going to get penalized. So I'm very concerned that all the new innovations that come on the market, ironically, are going to be priced at levels that are going to make headlines, but patients aren't going to get access to them. Okay. Well, uh, thank you very much. I really appreciate the time that you took. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, thank you uh, Dr. Mandel, for giving me this chance to talk first. So, so um, one of the things that is not in, in the, uh, the value um, algorithm um, is uh, somebody's value to other people in their life. So I'll, I'll do an anecdote um, of an individual physician uh, who was diagnosed with stage four lung cancer at age 48. Um, he had three sons. Um, they were um, in uh, elementary school, in middle school, um, and he had a, a, a protein uh, on one of his cancer cells uh, that only 6% of people with lung cancer have. Uh, standard therapy didn't work, failed. Um, he was put on an experimental medication that was from Pfizer, and uh, it bought him uh, four years, in which case a new drug came out um, that bought him uh, more time. Uh, and fast forward, there's 17 years later uh, that he's still living uh, age 65 now, um, having watched his kids graduate college, become productive members of society, and helping his family, and still working um, uh, as an emergency room physician. Um, that's the kind of thing you don't see, the benefit um, to the people in the ER that he's seeing and treating and helping, uh, to uh, friends and family, uh, and to, you know, uh, his dependents. Um, that he's involved in nurturing them and helping them grow into productive members of society. We don't, we don't put that in the algorithm when we look at those dollar amounts, uh, which is an argument for us to do that going forward um, if we're going to um, have a, a polynomial that's going to put value on every little thing. The other thing is, as you pointed out, it, with the red drug and the blue drug, some drugs work for some people and some drugs don't. And the ones that only work for 10% or 15% don't really get marketed very well. Uh, but nowadays with genetics uh, and the growth of genetics and individual marketing, uh, but also individual testing, we're starting to see that in the cancer world where people are doing tests. Even old drugs that have come down in value might be very successful to somebody. So there is a new horizon as long as we allow innovation to, to keep on going on. Um, so I'll, I'll ask you both questions, and, and, and either uh, uh, Dean Goldman or Dr. Trish, either one of you can, can answer it, whoever feels more comfortable um, or, or, or more qualified to answer it. Um, but first question I'd ask is, um, do you believe that PBMs, pharmacy benefit man uh, managers, offer significant savings to the American consumer, or as uh, Al Gospany uh, acting as an added rent taker, uh, inflating consumer prices? You touched upon that a little tiny bit. Um, I have my own bias on it, um, but it's the only um, industry that allows uh, rebates and quotes. Uh, kickbacks is probably the term I would use to describe them, uh, but if you could uh, address that issue. Sure, and actually I did call them kickbacks in a Washington Post op-ed, so I... The federal government calls them kickbacks, too, in the sense that it's the, a safe harbor from the anti-kickback statute. So we're all on, on the same page. But um, I, I think, first of all, let's talk about what an important service they did initially. 30 years ago, you know, if I want to come back to the economics of this. The right answer, and I talk about the Constitution, you know, innovators should have a period of time to recoup their money. But then it was very important to get generic drugs on the market because they lower prices and improve access. And so we want to encourage that. And when the PBMs first came on board, what they did is they encouraged generics 
They did mail-order pharmacy. They improved access. And they really changed the game. Uh, what has happened now is they've gotten such market share, and they're so living off this rebate world that uh, Aaron will probably talk about in a second, that they're actually discouraging the use of generics where they don't make any rebates, and they're encouraging the use of the original brands where they have these hidden rebates. So there, you will see in the news that uh, sometimes doctors are getting letters saying, please don't prescribe the generic, please prescribe the brand. And that just shows how perverted the system has become. But um, would you like to add sure. to No, so I mean, I think it, it's clear that there's a, a big distortion going on in the branded drug space. I think we're also starting to understand that um, this, as PDMs get more involved in the specialty pharmacy business and actually the distribution of these rarely used but high-cost drugs, they're also making a lot of money off the, the dispensing of those drugs and that they're using their leverage and they're kind of, they're, they're becoming such an important behemoth across many, like, verticals of the distribution chain that they are also distorting their contract negotiations with manufacturers to make sure that they're making enough money off the specialty drugs as well. And so it's becoming problematic to under, not just to, like, to, to truly quantify and understand what's going on because there's so many um, layers to this. We, you know, as researchers are uh, try to study this, try to quantify this, it's often very challenging to get uh, data on the prices of drugs and the rebates of drugs because they're considered proprietary. Um, but we did do an analysis looking actually in the generic drug space to say, well, how much are these kind of markups of the lack of competition in this industry um, causing? So not the rebates, but just the general other kind of lack of competition in this market. Um, and so what we did is we compared the prices that the, met, that the PDMs that serve the Medicare Part D program pay for commonly used generic drugs where we've got all these frictions and inefficiencies we compared that to what you would have paid if you bought those same drugs at Costco Pharmacy, where they cut out the middleman, where they're buying and selling drugs like their you know, common generic drugs like their paper towels, right? And and doing this in a competitive market at the lowest price, uh, delivering on low prices and value to consumers. What we found is that the Part D, the plans in the Medicare Part D program were overpaying on more than 40% of generic drugs to the tune of several billion dollars a year. And that that's an example of where this market is, is working well to serve the PDMs and not to serve the patient. Right. The other um, issue that I have that's a kind of a tangent to that um, is that costs get shipped and somebody else pays for the complications or problems. So, for example, um, the FDA for quality control um, allows a name-branded drug, uh, let's say a, a, a dose of 100 milligrams, uh, it has to be, uh, by quality control, between 98 and, and, and 102. Um, otherwise, that, that whole run is discarded, uh, adding the cost of the production of, of the name-branded drug. The generics have a wider range, so they're allowed to be, uh, as opposed to 100, uh, as low as 80 or as much as 125. So on a simple thing like a birth control pill, um, uh, gynecologists see more breakthrough bleeding or other irregular bleeding, no, that's not necessarily life-threatening per se, um, but then there's uh, bleeding that requires pads or tampons uh, that the woman then has to go buy, uh, and that would have been avoided if somebody else who wasn't getting a kickback uh, wasn't making a bigger profit uh, by giving a better quality drug and or a name-branded drug. Um, additionally with that, um, is, and, and we don't do studies on it, and I think that, you know you guys or other people should kind of really study on it, um, is, you know, how often does a generic fail? So, for example, you know, are there more uh, unwanted pregnancies, say, for example, on a generic medication, uh, if you did a double-blinded study uh, with the name branded drug uh, because the quality control um, is, is not as good and you don't have so much protection from it? You know, I don't, I don't know. I can tell them in our literature it doesn't exist, um, and the economic forces are such that, that the government doesn't really want to know the answer to that because... Uh, they're a co-conspirator with the PBMs in, in regards to the cost shift and forcing people um, into generics that might not necessarily be better. Um, I think you guys touched upon this a little tiny bit, but if you could just, again, focus on it. 
um, is do you believe that the uh, uh, IRA, the Inflation Reduction Act, uh, will really have a major impact on the cost of pharmaceuticals in America, um, or because it's only a limited number of drugs at first, uh, that it's unlikely that's going to really have a big impact because it's a limited number of drugs? Well, so to answer your question about the limited number of drugs, I think uh, – so the provisions require first 10 drugs in Part B and a couple years from now expanding into 10 and 15 over the next few years, also breaking into the Medicare Part B program. So 10 drugs, 15 drugs, you know, maybe doesn't sound like a whole lot, but if you look now at the top 10 uh, grossing products in the Medicare Part D program, they account for more than 20% of the gross spending in the Medicare Part B, uh, D program. On the Medicare Part B side, it's even more concentrated. They account for about 40% of, of total spending in that program. So, you know, you're talking about uh, a large chunk of change in terms of not just the, the kind of potential um, impact from the negotiations, but also coupling that with the inflation rebate, um, as well as some broader, these broader provisions that have to do with um, requiring manufacturers to pay much more of the share of drugs that are taken in the Part D program as well to the tune of billions of extra dollars. You know, it, it doesn't sound like a lot when you talk about 10 to 15, but when you put this all together, it actually has a pretty, uh, but has the potential to have a pretty big bite. Um, but, you know, as Dana mentioned, I think there's different ways in terms of thinking about price and, and uh, what, you know, what is, what is the way we should be conceptualizing price here. So, yeah, so from an economist's point of view, that's the, the Willie Sutton law. Uh, you bas they w basically went to where the money was hiding. Well, I, I do think, you know, the Willie Sutton principle did make, does make me want to add one. Think, now think about the innovator who hasn't developed the drug. They're saying, I don't want it to be too big. I don't want to get into that fifth group of 15. And what they're hoping is the, the government would still do that by lowering their prices. But that's not what they're going to do. What they're going to do is say, I will try to tailor it to a smaller population so I'm under the radar. And how does that benefit patients if we're now looking at, some, again, smaller sets of patient population? Yeah, it's important because um, if you're a patient who um, doesn't get uh, marketed the drug or doesn't get the drug prescribed, and ends up having a major complication or unfortunately passes away because they weren't given a drug that could help them, exactly. uh, th then to you and to your family, uh, it's, it's worth a lot. Um, but to Washington or to uh, your insurance company or the PBM that's contracted with your insurance company, they didn't really care because they just lost one consumer, which didn't really matter to them. Um, and, and so uh, in regards to, to uh, um, external price benchmarking that we, you talked about a little tiny bit. Um, you know, it's a widely used technique by the OCED countries to restrict manufacturers from arbitrary just raising prices. Uh, Americans have long been subsidizing, the, in my, my opinion, uh, Americans have been subsidizing the profits of pharmaceutical manufacturers uh, versus our uh, competing um, OCED countries um, who are getting discounts. Because we're paying for most of the R&D. Um, and... and uh, uh, other countries won't tolerate that. So, for example, in Japan, uh, the USA, Germany, UK, and France are used as benchmarks for the Japanese market. And so if an uh, offered price is less than 75% uh, than the foreign comparisons, uh, the price Japan will pay is adjusted actually upward, which is, uh, I think, bold and reasonable. Um, on the other hand, if the estimated price is more than 125% uh, of the foreign comparison cost, um, they negotiate it downward. Do you think that would be workable in the United States? Um, no. Uh, you know, all of this, I, I actually I want to come back. I want to give some hard data to what you said. It, we wrote a white paper on this at the Schaefer Center. 70% um, of global profits from, for pharmaceuticals are earned in the U.S. market. And, you know, Ameri in fact, the best policy for Japan and Germany and all these other countries is for the Americans to continue to pay high prices and for them to live off our munificence. And that's actually true. But the reason why we are pursuing things like Alzheimer's, cardiovascular disease, and not TB and these others is because Americans suffer from these diseases. And so one of the virtues 
from our perspective is we are paying high prices, but we also get the innovation for the conditions that we're really worried about. And you mentioned early on about your friend and the external costs of a disease. Think about Alzheimer's with all the burden of caregiving and the fact that your relatives don't remember you. When you add, look at the cost, that's a social epidemic on a scale that's, you know, hard to address in the, or hard to quantify or think about in the United States. And so I do think that, so international reference pricing falls apart if the United States starts to say, well, we're going to price with everyone else. You'll see a race to the bottom. And um, I didn't know you were a Trump supporter, but Donald Trump was the last one who proposed international pricing. And it just doesn't make any sense because the U.S. is funding innovation. What we really should be doing is thinking about how we can get other countries to pay their fair share, which is something we do in defense, for example. Right. You know, we worry about NATO and things like that, but they should be paying their fair share for innovation. Yeah. For, for the general public that's out there, um, this is a nonpartisan uh, <laughs> uh we, we don't support uh, uh, candidates uh, within the city of Los Angeles of one party or another party uh, at all. We don't take positions supporting one candidate or another one, uh, just because we are in an election cycle. Um, and, and I'll just say it as that. But having said that, but, uh, and, and I should point out, as dean of a policy school, I, I'm in the same way. So we, we got your sarcasm and humor. But uh, so, so the the. Um, so we, but we could pass a law that said to pharmaceutical companies, um, if you're going to charge um, X dollars uh, to, to a consumer or a company in the United States or to the federal government, to the Medicare system or Medicaid system, um, that the largest discount you can give to a foreign country that is uh, a competitor. So we're not talking about the developing nations in the world. We're talking about the OCED or uh, I would actually say Russia and China as well. Um, they, they shouldn't necessarily pay more than us, but they can't um, get a discount of more than 10% um, from, you know, uh, our, our uh, rack rate. Um, alternatively, if you're a developing nation uh, or an impoverished nation, uh, yeah, I think that uh, we should. And that's brilliant, and I would support that policy. You know, the, the net effect of the, the, you know, this gets to the, you know, well, why can't we just buy in Canada? Well, if we were actually buying in Canada, the net effect of this is that people would stop selling in Canada, and so the Canadians would be hurt the most by this policy. So. Right. Um, so go going back to uh, equitable pricing uh, policies, uh, Medicare Part D beneficiaries uh, pay about 83% um, of Medicaid. 40 you could correct me on these numbers. Um, these are numbers from my own research and uh, 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 I'm not an economist, so I'll, I'll stand corrected if, if I'm off on the numbers. But Medicaid programs pay about 48 percent, and veteran uh, benefit administrators pay about 46 percent of what the average American uh, pays. Now, I recognize average and means get manipulated. Um, it's not always the, the same thing, but it is. Uh, those numbers are, are as valid as I can find. Um, so in, in the current situation, as more baby boomers kind of get gray hair like I, um, and the ACA after expanded Medicaid dramatically across the country, especially in, in California and Los Angeles County, 50% um, of the patients are on Medi-Cal, uh, which is a really large number. Um, so basically, the, the average consumer is actually paying the lion's share of the industry's profits. Um, is that a huge tax uh, on every consumer who is actually paying um, either the, the fair market value um, or buying uh, health insurance that includes uh, a pharmacy benefit. Well, if you're right that different consumers pay wildly different prices. I mean, you mentioned the VA, and I, I think those numbers sound right to me. Uh, veterans, you know, they have a very restrictive formulary. In fact, if you went to the Medicare program and say, what fraction of Medicare Part D prescriptions would be allowed in the VA, or would be on formulary, so to speak, it's only about 60%. So 40% of the prescriptions in the Medicare program wouldn't be allowed. So they, they, the government has negotiated a very restrictive formulary for veterans, and they got very low prices. And, you know, Americans have 
said for a long time, generally we want a lot of choice and we don't want restrictive formularies and we want choice, we want to have access to what our doctor feels is best and we're willing to pay for it. And that's what generous drug insurance is about. But you're right that there is cost shifting between the private sector and the public sector. That's endemic in any system like ours where you have both private and public payers negotiating prices. But I will say, you know, you look at some of these large insurers, you know, like it used to be called Anthem. I don't forget what it's called now. Ele Elevance or something? Uh, anyway, Anthem, you know, it has as many beneficiaries as Switzerland you know, 65 million or something like that. So it's a country unto itself. It has a lot of negotiating power. And, you know, the question is, how can we use that to the benefit of patients rather than shareholders? Um, or just balance it a little bit better so that yeah. uh, shareholders gain, uh, pharmaceutical companies get enough money for R&D uh, and, and uh, further investment and return on investment. Um, but the consumers don't get, get soaked as much. Uh, I was pointing out, too, in this context, you know, it, it doesn't necessarily uh, speak to whether or not it's the right outcome, but this is quite true more generally in the healthcare system, right? So for hospital physicians, the rates that commercial insurers pay is quite different than the rates that Medicaid programs pay, too. So this is endemic to the system more broadly and not specific to the... If anything, I would say that the range is actually probably narrower in the prescription drug space than it is in some of those other sectors as well. Yeah. And, and, and we've seen that, unfortunately, during the pandemic, uh, and this commission has talked about the fact um, that two hospitals in L.A. City, uh, Olympia Hospital and St. Vincent's Hospitals, both basically went bankrupt uh, because uh, their population was primarily a Medicaid or, in say, California, Medi-Cal, um, and they couldn't pay the salaries of primarily nurses uh, and, and uh, other support staff uh, yeah. um, that worked at those hospitals um, and went bankrupt. Um, and we lost hospitals during a pandemic, which makes no sense whatsoever. And we've discussed that uh, ad nauseum at, uh, at this commission. Um, and lastly, uh, um, and legally and from an uh, economics point of view, um, could we change the patent clock just for you know, new, new drugs, so that um, it was, say, 20-year uh, patent uh, for drugs. Once it clears the FDA approval, um, as you know, it oftentimes takes six, eight years to get FDA approval, sometimes even longer. Uh, but when the drug's ready for marketing is when that clock starts ticking um, and, and made it 20 years. Um, and by granting the, the property rights, we'd also help patient rights because then, theoretically, you could amortize the cost of R&D over 20 years, um, the pharmaceutical companies still can make a significant uh, profit to make uh, Wall Street and the shareholders happy, um, as well as have money for further development of new drugs. Uh, but uh, the prices would actually would come down, so they wouldn't necessarily. Do, do you think that would would work? Um, and you know, with good government, uh, it could be regulated, so it would be fair both to, to the consumer, fair to the insurance companies, but also fair to to Big Pharma? I think that is the solution, and you've hit on what I think is the missed opportunity in public sphere. So what investors like is policy certainty, and actually patents have to be tested in courts, and they have to be fought, and you don't know if your patent is going to withstand. So what you're talking about is market exclusivity from the time you're approved and marketed for a certain number of years. And that makes a lot of sense and is great policy. And, you know, the, a lot of the games were, are played by manufacturers, too, trying to extend their patent life, getting exclusivity, limiting generics. And Hatch-Waxman, which actually was great bipartisan legislation, tried to rein in a lot of this. But I think what you hit on is exactly the right thing that, there was an opportunity, and maybe there still is, for a compromise between the industry and the regulators, and it would have involved having some certainty about market exclusivity so you could recoup your investment. 
but also saying we're going to get rid of all the games at the back end when your exclusivity is over. You know, gloves are off, and we want any anyone can make this drug, and they just have to prove it's safe, uh, which is what you were talking about with generics, um, which we do worry about, and also with biosimilars. Have um, any other countries done anything like that at all, or is mostly everyone's following us and looking at us? I think everyone's following us. I would just add, though, despite the, the now praise of the perfect policy, it, it would still require PDM reforms, right? Because our work has shown that they're keeping, even if we have this kind of guaranteed genericization at the end of this, it still requires making sure that gen those, those low-cost generics are widely available to consumers and, and spreading the benefits of this more broadly. So, so I'll add in, to combine your policy with antitrust uh, investigations, which the FTC is thinking about doing, uh, against the PBMs, and you would probably solve this problem and benefit yeah. the world, to be honest. Um, if, if, if I was the autocrat that you think that I theoretically could be or would be or support, um, I'd get rid of PBMs in a second. I think I've seen you in the exam room, and you are an autocrat. <laughs> uh, and, and so uh, I think 30 years ago, um, or, or maybe in the time of Richard Nixon, uh, the concept of a PBM was a good one. Um, but uh, I would say corporate greed uh, has gone out of control, and that's one place where Congress really ramped down on them and or just there's no other industry that you can do kickbacks. You can't do it getting a TV show shown or uh, I can't sing a bad song and, and put it on the radio and pay people to, to play it. Uh, that's gone back, you know, payola. Payola, yeah. You know, that's gone in for, you know, for years. That's probably over 100 years old, that, that uh, you know, the rulings on that. It's the only industry that allows kickbacks. Uh, nowhere else in corporate America is it allowed. And um, there is a safe harbor, so they're not breaking the law. Um, but there's an issue about ethics and morality. And, and uh, there's no question to me um, that uh, Congress would and, and want to get rid of that in a second. Yeah, no, I could I couldn't agree more with you. And, you know, this is a $400 billion industry, prescription drugs. And if you can figure out a way to siphon off just 3% of that, you know, you're talking about something, what, $12 billion or something like that. And that's effectively what's happening. And that $12 billion, I'd rather see it invested in a, a new variant of the COVID vaccine. Uh, so, or not a new variant of COVID, <laughs> but a new variant of the vaccine, just to be clear for the right. public webinar. Um, excellent. Um, so uh, any other commissioners have a question? You want to either raise your hand or just jump in. We have uh, two world experts that we're honored to have present to us. Um, not so uh -oh. Uh -oh. Can you hear me? Yeah, Dr. Choppa, you're up, please. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, so, a uh, question for either. Uh, a couple of times during this uh, Q&A, you've said uh, the concept of what they hope will happen is this, but what actually will happen is this. Presumably, they also have economists consulting on these concepts. So, is it that they got it wrong, or is there another way to look at some of these outcomes? Yeah, I think, you know, they, it, this is not... It's whether you take a short-term view or a long-term view. And the question, the problem is the economists working on the other side are taking a four-year view. The problem is this is a long-term, this is a 15, 20, it's even outside the scope of the CBO analysis. You really have to take a long-term view because the cycle for innovation right now, it takes about 17 years from the basic science to get it um, to the bedside. And so I don't think anyone is arguing um, realistically, for example, that prices don't affect innovation. I mean, some people will say that, but they're not being honest when they do that. I think what they're saying is we'd like some short-term savings, and we're not sure what the downstream consequences are, or they're downwinding. I see. All right. Thanks. You're on mute. 
uh, Dr. Mandel just came. Okay. Thank you. Um, any other commissioners have a uh, question for our renowned professors of economy? Seeing none, uh, Doctors Goldman and, and Trish, uh, thank you so very much uh, for joining us. You're welcome to stay on. We have some uh, uh, boring business to do, but we also know how busy you are. You have your own lives, so uh, we won't take it personal if you uh, uh, leave us. Uh, I would, uh, again, thank you. We're honored that you would come to present to us. Uh, we love the fact that uh, you're uh, based in Los Angeles City uh, and you're educating the world. Uh, about uh, uh, excellent policies, um, and we're really thrilled that you would present to us. I wish you both and your families uh, a wonderful Labor Day weekend and, uh, and, and good health and stay safe. So thank you very much. Thank you for having us, and thank you for also all the work you will be doing to make our colleagues not cough on us. We appreciate that, too. So. <laughs> well, we'll, tr we'll, we'll try. Uh, I will. I will say as long, as long as you're giving plugs to U USC, uh, that um, we've been thrilled uh, because we've had wonderful, wonderful uh, research associates, uh, uh, three of which uh, that have gone to USC, two of which are still with us, uh, working really hard as volunteers, uh, really running this commission, and uh, uh, without their um, help and, and assistance. Um, we could not do the work that we do, and, and uh, we're, we're thrilled um, to see really smart students uh, in your school um, and in your program. So thank and you. And dedicated. Yeah, that's that's what, quite on. <laughs> uh, thank you. All right. Thank, thank you. you very much. Thanks. Good night. Uh, move, moving on to to uh, we have to approve the minutes. Uh, uh, is there a commissioner that wants to? Oh, uh, City Clerk. Just for the record, um, w Commissioner Salas joined in the um, in the um, as a pan as a, a public uh, rather than a panelist. So she has been uh, in the meeting the entire time. But I don't know if she is able to um, communicate. Uh, you know, when we're asking to to vote or what have you. But I just. Wanted to let you know she is here, but she is connected through the public. Um, and, and Sarah, maybe you can help me. I'm not sure how. The I think she just, this. She, she just uh, unmuted. Oh, yeah. good that she is. I, I just unmuted. Yay. Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah, beautiful. Yes. Thank oh, you. Okay. And so just for the record, Commissioner Estradas has been here uh, from the beginning of the meeting. Excellent. All right, good. Thank uh, you. Uh, is, is, there are a motion to accept the minutes from August 8th. Uh, I'll make the motion. This is Kisrik. I'll make the motion to accept the minutes. Thank you, Kisrik. Is there a second? Second? I'm happy to second. Thank you, Dr. Chapa, uh, Commissioner Chapa. I've seconded it. Um, any other conversation, discussion uh, on the minutes? They look good to me. Uh, can we have the vote? Uh, yes, and I just want to point out that uh, Commissioner Avila was not present at that meeting, nor was Commissioners um, Estrada, Cato, Osi, um, who are here at our meeting, so you would uh, need to abstain. Um, but I'll go ahead and call the roll. So, um, I'll, and I'll call everybody's name. Commissioner Avila. Well, Commissioner Arila will be abstaining. Yeah. <laughs> Commissioner Chapa. Yes. Commissioner Estradas will be abstaining. Commissioner Grimmig is absent. Commissioner Hissarik. Aye. Commissioner Cato, I believe, has left the meeting. Commissioner uh, Calfani is absent. Commissioner Lemus is absent. Commissioner Mandel. Approve. Commissioner Osi. Um, Commissioner uh, Pack. Commissioner Avila, I'm approved, uh, Rita. Sorry. Okay, I'm here and I'm approved. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Avila. 
Commissioner Pack is absent. Commissioner Shannon is absent. Uh, Commissioner uh, Sirota was also not here at uh, the last meeting. Abstain. Sir Karras, thank you. Um, any um, other suggestions for uh, new business from any of the commissioners? Um, you're always uh, able to uh, contact me and or our research associates if you have ideas or uh, suggestions or things that you would like to have us uh, address. Um, I would point out um, two things. Uh, we do have a, a meeting scheduled on September 12th um, where we have invited uh, both the mayoral candidates uh, to uh, present and discuss uh, uh, several questions in regards to the relationship okay. of the city and the county, um, as well as um, with um, this commission, uh, as well as if they have ideas. Um, I've, I've been in communication with both um, candidates' offices uh, and uh, senior level uh, individuals uh, of their campaigns, including their uh, campaign chairs. Um, as of now, one of the candidates uh, is uh, almost 100% guaranteed that uh, that individual will, will be there. Um, and the other one will be out of town, but I've offered to make them available uh, via um, Zoom, as we are, uh, so that um, they, even if they're out of town, they could be here. I don't know what their decision is going to be. Um, I would say for the general public um, that it would amaze me that an individual who's running for mayor and has a commission that answers to that mayor, that that individual would not make themselves available. Um, but I have no control uh, over uh, any candidate in the city of Los Angeles. Um, having said that, um, we also are working uh, on our annual uh, report. Uh, we've started to work on that. Um, commissioners who would like to be involved with individual portions, uh, please contact uh, the research associates um, so that we could expand um, what we've done previously as well as work on um, all the reports and all the uh, presentations and discussions that we've had in the last uh, uh, year uh, at the commission. Um, you can get together in small groups uh, to discuss it. Uh, but uh, a reminder of the Brown Act uh, that it can't be more than um, half of the uh, commission at any one time or Zoom uh, without having a public notice available to uh, have other people join it. Um, I would say, however, um, to be even more cautious, uh, I would ask that uh, at no time more than four uh, commissioners work on a subcommittee on an uh, area so we're not even close uh, to the 50% rule of the Brown Act. Um, any comments? If not, um, I uh, thank uh, the, the uh, city employees uh, and uh, specifically uh, Ms. Marino from the city clerk's office for all the great work you do um, so we can get this up and operational. Uh, we could really not do um, the work of this commission um, without Ms. Moreno, um, as well as all the, the people who put on this uh, virtual meeting for us. So thank you very much. Um, also, uh, we'd like to uh, once again pub publicly thank uh, our research associates um, and our intern. Uh, and uh, our intern, Claire Williams, will be uh, I don't know if you're in North Carolina. If you are, thank you for staying up this late. Uh, but but uh, she's uh, yeah, matriculated to Duke University. And, and uh, uh, as we were talking about uh, just prior to the meeting, uh, a group of lacrosse schools, uh, Duke uh, has been an amazing lacrosse school uh, for years. Um, so uh, uh, if you haven't gone to lacrosse games, uh, uh, you should definitely go and, and, and watch Duke play. It's, uh, it's like going to the ballet. It's really worth it. Um, and uh, seeing no other comments, uh, can I have a, a motion for adjournment? I make a motion to adjourn. Uh, is there a second? I'll second. There's a second and a third. 
Um, uh, all in favor of adjourning? Yeah, let's go. All right. Thank you very much for having this extra meeting. Uh, in August, we had two meetings this August. Uh, I really appreciate all the uh, commissioners uh, for, for doing that. Um, it allowed us to do two things, one of which is to uh, uh, handle the uh, AB 361 uh, that we needed to anyway um, uh, to approve the minutes, um, but more importantly, to, to get this timely uh, discussion uh, with uh, Dean Goldman and uh, Dr. Trish. Uh, so uh, hand in glove with the, the uh, IRA to, to have this uh, good understanding for us. Um, so thank you very much. Everybody have a wonderful uh, Labor Day weekend. Uh, and I truly appreciate all the volunteer efforts. Uh, and uh, Commissioner Sirota, I think this is going to be your last meeting. Possibly. Uh, possibly. <laughs> uh, well, if it is your last meeting, because uh, uh, you're moving, uh, then... then uh, I, I moved. I moved. You moved. All right, well... Uh, I'm in South Carolina. You're in South Carolina. Well, uh, uh, maybe you should uh, take Miss Williams out for, for some coffee. Um, <laughs> and uh, you're pretty close. Um, but but uh, we still appreciate all the work you do for the city of Los Angeles and have done for the city of Los Angeles, and really appreciate uh, your efforts on this commission. Um, and when your uh, city council member um, who appointed you appoints a new person, uh, we will uh, graciously uh, uh, look forward to them joining us, and we will miss your uh, hard work and, and efforts for us. So thank you very much. Thank you. Go ahead.